Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our presentation, our first ever presentation of Stage Stories 2, which is our new next level class after uh, Stage Stories and Beyond Words, which means all of the writers you'll see today have taken the first two classes at the Wallace, and this is the next class. This is our first time that we did this, um, this level of the class. I'm Deborah Pascarette. I am the manager of community engagement at the Wallace, and I'm the lead artist for the Creative Aging Program. Those of you that haven't been to the Wallace, I hope you're able to go soon. We are actually open, and there are wonderful things happening on the stages, and hopefully in the future, our classes will be able to resume in person and, and be at the Wallace again. So I wanna thank everyone for their patience this morning. And I'm so excited to have you meet these writers. I think you will see there's a huge variety of storytelling that we have. The subjects are different. Um, there's just a lot of heart and soul and honesty and grit that they put into this work. And so I appreciate you joining us this morning. At the end of the performance, there will be a short Q&A with the writers. And so please don't go away at the end and we'll take just a few minutes so that you can ask them some questions. So I'd love to introduce our first writer this morning, Gail. Thanks, Deb. And um, the name of my story is What I Meant to Say, and it's from the prompt, What I Meant to Say. I was driving down Ashland Avenue around 7.30 a.m. on the first week of January, 1964. I suddenly pulled over in acute distress. I wasn't sure if I was going to vomit or explode. I could not tell what was happening, but sensed enough to know I was not sick. I was going crazy. How could this be happening today of all days? When I got home later, I told my mother I was going crazy and to call Dr. Gunther for a referral to a psychiatrist. He said it must be stomach flu. No, not so, I insisted. I started seeing a shrink who prescribed pills, but I was afraid they would work and then where would I be? He told me I was sexually repressed when I mentioned a dream about tomato soup. On that fateful day, I was on my way to my first day of teaching. My assignment, a third grade class at the Jenner School in the middle of the Cabrini greenhousing projects. It deserved its bad rap. I was barely 21, naive, sheltered, idealistic, and totally unprepared for what awaited me. I was shown to my room and unceremoniously dunked with a clear message, figure it out for yourself. The kids would not listen to me. They ran in and around the cloakroom doors and out the hallway. Oh, and by the way, they could not read. The principal, rather than give me support and advice, would come in the room and yell at me to control them. I came home every night sobbing. Of course, I never told my parents. We never talked about anything. Several months passed. One day while at the psychiatrist, he told me I had a choice. I did not need to go back. I was stunned. I never knew I had options. I was indoctrinated into believing that I had to follow the path my family chose for me. I came home and at the dinner table, I yelled, I am not going back. I am not going back. I did not know another way to be heard. To my shock, I was told this was fine. Again, no questions were asked. How could I say what I meant to say when I did not know what I meant to say? In hindsight, this is the conversation we should have had. I am ill-prepared. I am a failure. I don't know what to do. How can I get married in June and be responsible? I never was responsible. I am giving up my youth to do what you said was acceptable. 
I feel old. I am lost. Help me, please. I am afraid. Thank you. And now I'm happy to introduce our next reader, Deborah. Deb. Sorry, Deb. <laughs> Thank you, Gail. Hi, I'm Deb, also Deborah. Based on the prompt, Invisible, my piece is entitled Invisible by Choice. If I'm invisible, am I lonely? Is loneliness being invisible? For me, it depends. I felt lonely and invisible as a child and in my marriage. I now choose to be invisible and I'm not necessarily lonely. I call it solitude, peace, and tranquility. Watching the short on 52 Blue made me sad for the whale and that he didn't have a choice. He had no known voice and therefore couldn't communicate with whale, other whales of his species. I have a voice I choose not to use most of the time, or at least a lot of the time. But does that make me invisible? Not sure. Growing up when I did, Children were seen, but not heard. We were seen and therefore not invisible. But we were silenced because what could a child possibly offer to any conversation? During my marriage, my husband wanted to be center stage and I was to stand behind him gazing adoringly, catering to his every whim. Neither situation was a good setup for my self-esteem. But I left those situations because, well, I grew up in both instances. Enter 2020, wherein everyone became invisible behind their masks to avoid a potentially deadly virus. We self-isolated and became housebound, not by choice but by mandate or simply the desire to stay well and alive. Some of us, the extreme introverts, relished the solitude. Others melted into puddles of gloom. I love my pandemic masks. Behind the mask, dark glasses and a hoodie, I can be in my own invisibility cloak. No one sees me, but I see all. This pandemic, the invisibility it has provided to me, this has been my Harry Potter moment, invisible by choice, but not lonely. Thank you for listening to my piece. It is with pleasure I now introduce you to Sidel. Thank you, Deb. <clears throat> my piece is called Opening Doors and the prompt was doors. She checked herself in the mirror, making peace with the older version of herself. For six months, the pandemic had held her prisoner, isolated behind closed doors. But tonight she was going out and her heart was racing. She took some deep breaths before making the drive. It was only a mile, but it felt like a journey to the other side of heartbreak. She pulled into the parking garage, checked the mirror again, and reached for her phone. I just parked, she texted. I'm here, he wrote back. Oh, good. She wasn't the first to arrive. I'm wearing black with a black and white scarf, she wrote. And his reply made her laugh. I'm naked, he shot back. It figures, she retorted, enjoying the banter. So with studied confidence, she strutted toward the restaurant. And then she saw him. A handsome man with a full head of thick silver hair. He whipped around in his seat and waved. So she swiveled onto the other side of the outdoor table and removed her mask. Hi, I'm Sadat. He smiled. 
I'm Michael. You look just like your picture. Very pretty. She began to relax. They talked about their careers. He was interested when she told him she was a theater professor. Who's your favorite playwright, he asked. Ibsen, she replied without hesitation. I've read an Ibsen play in college. A woman named Mrs. Alvin with syphilis. Sound familiar? Of course, she answered. But for the life of her, she couldn't remember the name of the play. He was a restaurant owner and let her in on the best place in town for eggplant parmesan. I love eggplant, she gushed. Oh, good. I'll have to take you there. A bottle of wine later, he returned her to her car. She felt alive and liberated for the first time in months. As she drove to the ticket booth and got out her wallet to pay, the attendant waved her on. The gentleman behind you already paid, he said. Wow, nice touch, Michael. The next day, she searched like mad for the name of that Ibsen play. Ghosts, of course. Well, good excuse for a text, she thought. I remembered the name of that Ibsen play, she wrote. It's been bugging me. He answered right away. Mm, I'm getting under your skin. That's a good sign for a new relationship. Still want to go for that eggplant parmesan? And so it began. The romance between two transplanted New Yorkers who found each other on Match.com during a global pandemic. And here we are. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Ellie. Thanks, Adele. My name is Ellie, and the name of my piece is The Man on the Hood. The prompt for my story was silence. Help! There's a psychotic man leaning on the hood of my car, staring at me through the windshield. We're both silent as he waits. I thought I had found the perfect parking place close to the restaurant on Magnolia where I'm meeting my friend Tom. This is clearly not the perfect parking place. The man's glare terrifies me. There are no sounds of cars driving by, of people chatting as they walk along the sidewalk. No one is here to rescue me. The man seems to be daring me to do something. But what? Run him over? I am so tempted. Always the documentarian, I take his picture. His menacing stare intensifies. I call Tom. Hi, where are you? His sweet voice makes me want to cry. There's an insane man leaning on the hood of my car. He's not moving, and I'm afraid to get out. I'll be right there. No, I shout, he might hurt you. Tom has already hung up. I decide to try backing up the car to create space for an escape. My assailant leans forward, hooks his fingers into the space where the windshield wipers are, and he rides on my slowly moving car, his eyes never leaving mine. Suddenly, the monster lurking inside him emerges. He bends down and violently rips the grill off the front of my car and hurls it at the windshield. Unfazed by the loud crash, he slowly approaches my door. My panic pushes my foot down on the gas pedal and my car zooms forward. I leave him behind and barely able to see past the grill lying on my hood, I speed down Magnolia. I spot Tom jogging towards me. I pull over. He climbs in and quietly hugs me. I'm shaking, too numb to cry. We park far from my imperfect parking place and walk to the restaurant. We sit there in silence, looking at each other until we both burst out laughing. Thank goodness for dark humor. 
there's a $250 deductible to repair my car. The man on the hood doesn't pay for the damages. And here he is. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce my classmate, Judy. Thank you, Ellie. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Judy. The name of my essay is Freedom Door. It's based on the prompt, write about a door. Home from a long work day, I park in the driveway. <clears throat> His car is not there, no surprise. I get out of my car, reach for my briefcase and purse and walk to the front door, exhausted something feels different. The glass panels on either side of the door, uh, the side lights look strange. What's going on? Then it hits me. The sheer curtains are missing and I can see inside. In a heartbeat, it's crystal clear. Adrenaline kicks in, he's gone. The bare floor reflects late afternoon light. I don't see the dining room table. I find my keys and enter. There is no furniture in the living room or dining room. I turn back toward the den, same story. The only place to put my purse down is on the kitchen counter. I start opening cabinets and see bare wood. No dishes, no glasses, no pots or pans, no cereal, no spices, no cans of soup. And all of these missing items have taken him with them. The coat closet is empty. My coat, scarves, boots, and hats are keeping his coat, scarves, boots, and hats company, wherever they may be. Was this some kind of twisted robbery? Then I realized that no, he has just taken everything rather than sort out what's mine from what's his. It's a gut punch. I go up the stairs, not trudging from the tiredness of the long day at work, but energized from trying to make sense of what's happening. Upstairs, same story. All of the furniture and window treatments are gone. Even the artwork is gone. I go back downstairs, grab my purse and exit that same door, my freedom door. I'm feeling better and better. I'll buy survival gear for tonight, dinner, something to sleep on, something to wash with, something to listen to. Now it's my pleasure to introduce my classmate, Sunny. Thank you, Judy. My name is Sunny. The title of my piece is Listen for the Beauty, and it's based on the prompt, Silence. There's an aspect of music as vital as the notes. If its splendor isn't there in just the right amount, I miss it, I crave it, I rewrite it. It's the silence between the phrases, the shaper of the meaning, the place for the breath, the back and forth of life. In the silence before the beginning, with a conductor's baton poised to cue the first note of an orchestra or a choir, if one chair creaks or one patron snipples, silence is merely a theory a quest, a grand attempt. I have ventured to the wide, wide outside, the exquisite serenity of Minnesota midnight snow, dark sky deserts, Colorado mountains, and the deep down inside, soundproofed, sequestered, meditative. Silence always remained a fascinating concept, reverent, gorgeous, 
But something was always sneaking in, joining, analyzing, often me. Even thinking about silence breaks the silence. I came close in a forest, purposely detoured after a gig, standing in King's Canyon, staring up at giant sequoias. No traffic, no loneliness ever, just magnificence. Memories moved in, dreams, loved ones, supposedly gone, but they still giggled in my imagination, crouching behind me in the huge hollow log. Melodies appeared in me like gifts, maybe from them. Life finds a way to be shared. Lady Alice, a sequoia so immense she has a name plaque, rustled her leaves like page turns of programs in theaters. Before I left, I played a little bit of Beethoven's Ode to Joy for the Trees, a piece he wrote when he was completely deaf and supposedly couldn't hear a thing. In the great indoors, I came close to captivating silence at Capitol Records in Hollywood. Their building's a cylinder, iconic as the Leaning Tower of Pisa I'd visited one Mother's Day. Capitol's tower, though, stands straight, proud, holding gold records on hallowed hallway walls, leading to its world-class recording studios. I stood before a $10,000 microphone the one Frank Sinatra used to sing Fly Me to the Moon. Its history trembled me, birthing bliss. I pictured my parents swing dancing, smiling. They would have loved it there. Tight headphones covered my ears, waiting for the engineers to start the music track. The silence before the song was as deafening as the silence before writing a song, full of all inner and outer space. But life finds a way to be heard. The legendary microphone picked up the very beat of my heart. Ba-boom, ba-boom, like music. Ba-boom, ba-boom, like a kick drum with just a little silence between the phrases, just the right amount to keep on trying to make beautiful, grateful music. And now I'd like to present our next presenter, Ellen. Thank you, Sunny. My piece is called, Oh My God, I Left Out Something. It was inspired by the prompt about the whale who searched for another whale that made the same sound, 52 blue. Hi, Jim. I, I'm calling because I haven't been put on the schedule to direct for a couple of weeks. Is everything okay? You better come in. I walk into the Fox Network's totally hidden video production office and Jim tells me to close the door. I sit. I have a huge lump in my throat. I'm internally running my very own Kentucky Derby in my head. The horses in the race are, I'd done something wrong, blown a chute, a male crew member who has been nice to me to my face has complained about me behind my back, rankled to be working for a woman director. What's up, Jim? Steven upstairs doesn't like you. I, I've never met Jim. I mean, Steven, wh wh why doesn't he like me? You don't get enough jiggle. I have no idea what you're talking about. Jiggle? You know, tits and ass. 
now I really don't know what you're talking about. Between shots, you don't videotape women's butts and chests so we can use them for interstitials between bits. What? The other directors do that? Yes. Did I miss a memo? Were the directors told to do that? No, we don't have to tell them, they just do it. I'm never invited to go have a beer or golf with the other directors who are, maybe it's not even necessary to say, but that's never stopped me before, all white, apparently heterosexual men. I, I, I'm struck speechless. I had no idea that an unspoken agreement was to surreptitiously get tape of unconsenting and unsuspecting women's orchestra and balconies. If I'd been directed to do that, I would have refused, or at least I like to think I would have refused. I probably would have done something smart ass like shooting dogs butts and chests. As it stood, my dream job and a breakthrough for all women was nipped in the bud because I didn't understand the boys club and didn't participate in a practice that I find repugnant. Jiggle, my ass, which they could kiss. And now I'd like to introduce Jim, the next presenter. Hi, thanks, Ellen. My name's Jim. The name of my piece and the prompt that inspired was is called What I Meant to Say. What I meant to say is, you're not going out wearing that schmata on your head, are you? What I said is, you always wear such unique things. What I meant to say to someone I really disagreed with is, like my mother always said, Everyone's entitled to their own opinion, no matter how stupid it is. What I said is, let's agree to disagree, honey. What I meant to say is, you know, you've been in some lousy plays, but this one takes the cake. What I said is, I've never seen anything quite like this. What I meant to say to my ultra conservative friend is Donald Trump is a fascist, Mike Pompeo is a pompous ass, Josh Hawley is a self-righteous frat boy, and Tom Cotton is a humorless autocrat. What I said to my ex-ultra-conservative friend is, what has happened to the Republican Party? What I meant to say, is your dog's name Cujo? What I said is, if you need an obedience trainer, I have one I can recommend. What I meant to say to my friend who invited me to dinner, this is the worst meal I have ever eaten. I may vomit. What I said is, I think this dish needs a little more salt. What I meant to say is, you call that singing? Cats and heat are more on pitch than you. What I said is, do you know, play by the window and I'll help you out? What I meant to say is, what do you mean you don't want to get vaccinated? Are you a moron? What I said is, what do you mean you don't want to get vaccinated? Are you a moron? And now I'd like to invite my fellow writers back for a Q&A. Hey, let's have everybody come back and we can hear the thunderous applause, thunderous applause from our audience that I'm sure is happening. We just can't physically hear it, but I know it's happening and we're having incredible, incredible comments in the chat. So thank you, everyone. So first of all, I want to introduce uh, Victoria Kemsley, who is one of the teaching artists in uh, the program at the Wallace, and she has been a huge support for our, for our class. And so I wanted to give her credit here. And then what 
clap for everybody. Yes. Woo. And then what I would love to do is anybody in the audience that has a question, uh, please put it in either the chat or the Q&A and I will see it. But in the meantime, um, what I wanted to do is ask the writers, we had, there were the prompts that we had this time, some of them were a little more difficult. They had like sort of two parts to them or there were things they had to watch or listen to, uh, to be able to respond to the prompts. So what I wanted to do is ask um, the writers, what was your favorite prompt that you responded to? Or what was the most difficult for you? And if it's something like 52 Blue or one of those that has more parts, explain that so people can see that there's more than one thing. Yes, Ellen, go ahead. Well, the one that I loved the most and found the most uh, complicated was 52 Blue. First of all, the idea of a beautiful whale and her journey listening for somebody on her same frequency was completely touching to me. And I don't think I'll ever forget that as a metaphor and wondering how many of us are wandering around in the sea waiting to hear our song somewhere. Um, the um, And then I, I saw in one of the, I don't know, it was a commentary about 52 Blue that they picked up another whale that happened to have that um, same frequency. And uh, I, I'm just hoping that they found each other <laughs> because it sucks to be all by yourself singing a song. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ellen. And for those of you that don't know what she's talking about, you can look up 52 Blue and read about her, or um, you can take, take the class and find out about the prompt as well. So that would be another way to find out. Who else wants to talk about what either was difficult or uh, was good for them or any of the prompts or any of the, the writing uh, choices we had this semester? Yes, Sunny, go ahead. Well, I, the word difficult is kind of funny. I, the 52 blue prompt and all of the prompts really, the, the challenge for me was that it, they could go so many different places. It was hard to pick which, which story to tell. Um, and I, I loved all the prompts, um, but it's interesting that some of them, uh, wanted to lead towards loneliness like the 52 blue one but i guess being a singer and a, and a songwriter we spend so much time alone anyway working on our craft that it just it just isn't ever lonely to me so it it, it brought up just beautiful stories and beautiful ways to even look at 52 blues life which is kind of interesting because watching the video it seemed like people just assumed oh you're going to be lonely but that's not necessarily true you can maybe 52 blue doesn't even know that it's the only one <laughs> it's just kind of interesting it, it can lead you a lot of ways um but i tend to just want to find the most grateful hopeful place to go with it um but it was all just so fascinating it was lovely and everyone's story was so moving and all the prompts. It was wonderful. Great. Thank you, Sunny. Yes, Sidel, go ahead. And then we have a couple of questions in the chat I'm going to get to as well. Go ahead, Sidel. I, I just wanted to say that the prompts were all open-ended. And so you could go in many directions, like Sunny said. The most interesting thing to me was to hear how differently everybody interpreted the same prompt. It was very creative to be able to make different choices. I loved it. Great, thank you, Sidel. That's the joy of being in the class and being with these people for, um, I'm gonna go back, there was a question about somebody named Darren. So Darren, thank you, has turned in for three of the, tuned in for three of the shows and watched the shows and said that they just keep getting better and better. And so uh, saying that today was the best that, that they've seen. So. Uh, thank you, Darren, for that. And also um, asked if we were uh, 
talking or, or are we planning on publishing the stories at some point? And at this point, there's no plan to publish in a hard copy, but we do have a library of the performances on the Wallace website. And you can go back and watch any of the shows um, from previous classes, all of the different classes online. So please, please check that out. Um, another question we had was, and I'm gonna go, I don't want to miss it here. Um, can you share about the process of write of the class? How long was the class? And did people go through a rewriting or editing per process? And how did that work? Uh, would people rewrite and bring things back? Um, so the class is 10 weeks long. Um, this is our 10th class, and then we have one following class, which is a sort of a cast party where we get together and just um, get to meet each other for those of us that are on, because we've been on Zoom, or we just get together to actually just enjoy each other and talk about the process and how much fun we've had in class and everything that's happened in the last 10 weeks. Um, in terms of rewriting, we don't have a chance to rewrite in here because it's a 10 week class. There's a new piece every week. And so this class is not a big editing rewrite class. This is really a class for kind of first response to the prompt, comments from myself and the students. And then your final piece, I actually edit that piece. Um, I work as an, I, I'm an editor as well. And so I, I edit each of the pieces with each student and have a private session with them. And that's the, those are the pieces that you saw today, their final piece. And so then they go back and rewrite or tweak those if they need to, and then come back and perform it uh, for today. Um, because part of, I mean, there's, there's, the writing is a big component of the class, but the other two things that are incredibly important are the sharing of the story, um, stage stories, sharing, I mean, once upon a time before the pandemic, we were in the theater. And so we were actually doing this live and doing a performance in the Lovelace Theater at the Wallace. So it's sharing the stories. And then also the community that's built with the people in the class. And I think some of you guys could probably speak to that. Some of you have had classes with uh, people several times in this group. Um, and so uh, I think people have really gotten to know each other through their stories which is kind of amazing. So, um, and people you would have never probably met, except for you ended up in a Zoom room and started sharing your deepest uh, thoughts and it, with everybody in the in the room here. So, um, so hopefully I answered your question. Um, does anyone want to, let's see, I'm just making sure I'm not, um, okay, I'm not missing anything. So, um, does anybody want to talk about that, about the community or like how that's how that's been for you? Yes, Jim, go ahead. And then Judy and then Ellie. Okay. Yeah, I think that it, it, the class, we bring our, our writing to it, which we've worked on during the week. And the other thing, the other element is that we're limited to be 300 to 350 words. So that uh, forces uh, the writer to focus on the most important elements. But what I found so uh, uh, wonderful is that, you know, there's uh, nine of us and each one of us reacts to the prompt in a different way. And that, uh, and in very surprising ways. And also the other thing that's happened over the, this is the third class of my attention, is that the uh, uh, you get to know people through their stories because people have been very honest and forthright and uh, revealing uh, things that are somewhat difficult. Uh, and in some cases, uh, you know, things that are really celebratory and they have a chance to, especially in the pandemic where we don't get to see a lot of people, we become that audience. I'm thinking of Exidel's story about meeting that person and is glad that she could share that or, you know, uh, Ellen's story about the, you know, uh, the discrimination, but uh, these are, it's great to be able to get to know people that way through their stories. Great. Thank you, Jim. Who had two other people had their hands up? I think it was um, Ellie and Judy. So Judy, go ahead and then Ellie. Uh, this is the third class that I've taken with you, Deborah. And um, as many as you give, that's how many I will take. I really love it. 
What I'd like to say is that uh, I'm constantly surprised at how quickly the trust builds within the class. People disclose things that they might not to relative strangers. Uh, with this class, I have only had an intersection with one other person, which is Sidel in another class, but um, I still felt like I knew everybody immediately. It was very, very enjoyable for me, particularly. Thank you. Go ahead, Ellie. Um, well, this, I agree with everything Jim and Judy said, and um, uh, some of the prompts uh, inspired some very um, personal, emotional memories. And this really was a very safe place and a safe group of people. And Deborah and Victoria uh, um, helped that to, to share such vulnerable things. Um, and also to, to stretch creatively. Um, all three of the classes have have been just great for me to um, to do that and and inspiring to hear the other uh, people in in the group uh, in the class uh, to share their you know their experiences their views of the world their views of their life and to um, keep noting any inner critic that pops up and gets in the way. Um, which Deborah addresses at the beginning of the of the class. So um, it's it, I would encourage anyone who's considering it to take these classes.